But I actually went down to the Polk County District Court and watched you try a case once. You probably don't remember that. And she was fabulous. <laughs> I mean, really. Like, just fabulous. Did I win? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and thank you, Sally, for introducing me. Sally and I have known each other since we were 14, so it's been a long, wonderful relationship. Well, Tamara, where is she? Right. There you are. Tamara convinced me to do this, and uh, she wanted me to talk about the 2009 Varnum decision and what I have been doing since I left the court, and about the Harkin Institute, and do all that in 15 minutes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> 15 minutes. And uh, I've talked a lot about the the Varnum lawsuit, or as I will mention in a little bit. I am most excited to talk about the Harkin Institute because that's the here and now and what I'm doing and it's, it really is exciting. So I'll spend most of my time doing that, but I do want to be true to my agreement with Tamara to touch on the other two topics. Well, you're all from Iowa, I think, and you are well aware of our, uh, the Iowa Supreme Court's decision in Garner versus Breen, so I'm not going to review that. And you certainly are well aware about what happened after that decision, so I'm not going to talk about that either. But there is one aspect of Varnum that I think has some relevancy today, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And that topic is how the decision in Varnum was made. Now at the time, and certainly in 2010, there was a lot said about the decision just representing the justices' agenda, personal agendas, I assume, um, which those of us on the court, when we heard that, really literally just laughed out loud at how ridiculous it was. And I'm going to tell you, in fact, uh, how that decision came about. It actually, I think the, the context for the decision um, in part began in 2006 when I became the Chief Justice and the Seven of us on the court sat around a table and talked about what kind of court we wanted to be and how we wanted to treat each other and how we wanted to go about making decisions because the courts operate in, in different ways and some of them operate like little mini legislator, legislators, legislatures and others I think are more true to how uh, courts of last resort are supposed to operate and that is to bring all of the wisdom on the court and all of the diverse perspectives on the court to bear on an issue and in the process make a collective decision that is um, better than the sum of its parts. And so that day in 2006, um, we literally promised each other that we would use or give our best and genuine efforts to arrive at a collective decision that was intellectually honest and well-grounded in the rule of law. In other words, that our decisions would be based on law and not on any outside influence, including any personal preferences that we might have. And we concluded that in this way, we could best uphold our office and our obligation to the people of Iowa. Well, so now we go ahead three years and we're um, confronted with the Varnum case. We had agreed in our operating procedures that we weren't going to discuss cases privately among ourselves prior to the case being submitted on oral argument. In other words, there wasn't going to be any behind the doors lobbying and lining up votes. That in fact it would be an, a, a fresh discussion around the conference table and a collective decision being made. So we each individually read the trial court proceedings, the voluminous briefs that were filed, I think there were 26 or 27 amicus briefs, and we all read notebooks of the case law that um, had been put together for us. We entered the conference room to dis discuss what the law required, not focused on how we individually wanted the case to come out, but focused on let's discuss the issues we have here and how the law applies to that, and that's what we did. And I think I can speak for everybody on the court, and while I'm confident I can, we didn't know how it was gonna come out when we walked into that conference room. 
And because every other state who had decided this issue had done so on a split decision, I know I personally figured that there would be disagreement. We followed our normal process, which is for the uh, pre-assigned opinion writer, which, by the way, we drew names out of a hat, and that's how that occurred. Begins the discussion, uh, uh, reviews the issues, and says how he thinks the case ought to come out. And then we just go around the table just in order of seating, and we have assigned seats. That's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> that goes back decades. And we saw as we went around the table that everyone had independently reached the conclusion that the law that was being challenged violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Iowa Constitution. And I think as, as we kept going around, and I was the next to the last person to talk, um, we, we were kind of flabbergasted that it was a unanimous decision. In retrospect, and not, I mean, fairly quickly, we recognized, well, of course it was unanimous. How could, it, how could anybody see the law and apply it to these facts who, who, who was actually focused on the rule of law and not on what was happening outside of the judicial branch building? How could anyone come to a different conclusion? And that's how the decision was made. I think the Barnum decision and the process that we used in reaching that decision is an example of how a court committed to the rule of law operates. None of us worried about our judicial careers, even though we knew that, that there was a risk. None of us were committed to promises made in an interview with the Judicial Nominating Commission or with the governor. None of us were bound by representations made to voters or campaign contributors during a retention election. None of us had a personal agenda. None of us were ideologues committed to a certain judicial philosophy. We were simply judges of the law. With the increasing politicization of the judiciary in Iowa and really across the nation, there is a real threat to the rule of law. And notwithstanding the obvious love of politics for everybody in the room here, uh, I really do urge you each to resist this trend and, and I certainly uh, appreciate the efforts of the uh, Democratic Party in the last election to uh, resist the politicization of the retention elections. I think that only in that way can we um, have a Supreme Court that makes decisions based on the law and free of preordained results. So thank you for your support of that. Okay. What I've been doing since then, I've pretty much split my time between being a legal consultant for other attorneys who have uh, issues that they maybe want some uh, perspective of someone who served on the Supreme Court. So I've been working with attorneys on cases when called upon. And I've spent, as Sally said, a lot of time traveling uh, across the country speaking about judicial independence, the politicization of the judiciary, and the threat that that poses. I've literally been from one coast to the other, uh, from Phoenix to Minnesota, and I actually had the opportunity to speak at the conference of the International Bar Association in Dublin, Ireland. And I can tell you the rest of the world were appalled. I mean, they were just appalled. They couldn't believe my story. Because most, well, Nearly every country, other than some cantons in Switzerland, uh, have merit selection. They, they, were, they could not believe that, that states in the United States elected judges had judicial elections at all, which kind of surprised me. We live in a little cocoon here, I think. So there has been a lot of interest and concern about what happened here. Uh, certainly what's happening is much worse in states where there is a politicized ju judiciary because of the political nature of their uh, selection and retention. So we, we still have it pretty good here, and I don't have any complaints about our system notwithstanding how it operated in my particular case. It's still the best way to do it.